Good evening. It's my honor and privilege to welcome you to an exchange for media conversation in an association with Pitch and Impact. Today, we are going to talk to who's done it all, who's worked with brands, clients, agencies, and has now reinvented herself as an author and somebody who teaches at business schools. Um, maybe she's going to be the next Prashant Kishore, uh, the female version of Prashant Kishore. But uh, let me welcome Ms. Jashri Sundar, who doesn't really need an introduction to an advertising marketing media gathering. Uh, but today we're not talking to Ms. Jashri Sundar as uh, just somebody who knows advertising, marketing, media, brand building, but somebody who's written a seminal book on how to do marketing during election, how to do political campaign. So let me welcome Ms. Jashri Sundar, and I would also request her to show her book, which she's written, Don't Forget 2004, Adventurous Election Secrets from a Surprise Win. So uh, welcome, Ms. Sundar, and good evening to all our viewers, uh, those who are tuned in either on exchangeformedia.com or on our social media platforms. So Jashri, uh, first of all, congratulations. I'd love you to show your book. Uh, uh, Firstly, thank you, Anurag. We've known each other for years. It's an absolute pleasure and honor for me to be here today. And since you're asking, I will show the book. This is the book, Don't Forget 2004, Advertising Secrets of an Impossible Election Victory. It's thank a you month so much. Old. It's a young book, it's just out. Not too thick. People tell me it takes three to four hours to finish it. So, yeah, here we are. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank Let me, uh, we'll dive into the book and what made you write it and what's in it and so on and so forth. But before that, let me start by asking you, the last 23, 24 months have been life-changing for a lot of people. Yes. In good ways, in bad ways. Uh, there's been a loss of lives and livelihoods. I want to start by asking you, how have you been personally and professionally doing over the last 23, 24 months? Well, personally, it was really hard, I think, for the whole world, and I'm no exception. It was a very, very hard time that we all lived through. Uh, professionally, I must say that it was a very prolific time for me because I worked very hard. I think that was the only way I coped with this. So I did a lot of teaching at this time. Of course, it was all to a screen. So it was a whole new experience, but it was just going back to back throughout the year and a lot of webinars nonstop. But more than that, I did two books, uh, two diametrically opposite books, one book, which is on cooking and it's called The Tambram's Recipes. And let me just show it. It's again, a very new book. So The Tambram is what I uh, jokingly refer to my husband as. So this has got a whole lot of lovely vegetarian, South Indian cuisine meant for millennials, young people, very easy to do. This book just came out in October. So he cooked and I wrote and photographed and it's a completely home produced book. After which I um, actually a little before this, I got around to writing, don't forget 2004. And um, it, took, uh, it took me uh, just three months to write it. Then we went into the process of finding a publisher and editing and you know, it's like fantastic timing that it came out in January when India is in the middle of five assembly elections right now. So it's a very hot topic. And yeah, the book is out. So two books and a lot of teaching. So that's how, you know, it was for me professionally. Thank you so much. You made use the word prolific and I get it. Because <laughs> my way of coping with lockdown um, was exactly the same. I put more energy into my work and yes. uh, clearly uh, that kept my mind uh, busy, occupied, and of course, uh, there was also responsibility of 300 people that worked with me. So clearly, uh, we transformed a business world in exchange for media state at the forefront of our industry. But now coming back to yeah. why did you write this book now? Of course, you had the time. Uh, why this title? Why did I write this book now? That's a good question. And, um, you know, it's a story that had to be told. Secondly, it's about a general election. It's not a soap or a shampoo that you buy every week or you know something like that. We've just had three general elections in the middle. I thought I'd be doing a disservice to my profession if I had kept probably one of the biggest case studies that Indian advertising, marketing, branding, political world has seen, if it was just tacit with me and my team, because we lived through something so unbelievable 
and which was a David Goliath story. And there was, uh, I also wanted to take people behind the scenes into an advertising agency because people don't know too much about this world, except they think it's very glamorous and there are a lot of models and, you know, everyone's very edgy and very creative and it is all that. Okay. I'm not denying it. It is an exciting world, but uh, that's probably 5% of it. There's a lot of rolling up of your sleeves and working and I wanted to create. So this is my diary. This is the diary of my personal diary of what unfolded between January and May of 2004. And it goes day by day, day part by day part as to how this whole thing got crafted and created. So I wanted to bring this ex twofold exciting thing to readers, which is what happens in an ad agency. And two is this fantastic case study. And uh, your second question was why this title? Why this name? Why, why yeah, this name? Don't, don't forget 2004. So I uh, was actually thinking that I need to get something which will, which is going to engage or beckon somebody to want to know what happened in 2004 that she's asking us not to forget it, you know? Because it is in a way something that happened some years ago, but what has changed ever since, you know? the when I did my research, I found most of the issues are the same. So something that was so phenomenal, I think 2004 was the year when two really gigantic uh, advertising or branding campaigns were pitted against each, up, each other, probably never in the history of Indian politics has it been like that. And actually when the Wall Street Journal reported on 2004, they said global branding and political branding comes to India for the first time. So that's why I'm saying like, let's please go back to 2004. There's a lot to learn from 2004. Okay, and now I'll also ask, who do you think should pick up this book and read? Who is the reader of this book? Who will this book benefit? And what is the impact you're looking to make on someone who reads this book? Right. So, um, you know, I, I could give the most um, obvious answer, which is, you know, students should pick it up because it's a case study. It's for MBA people or people in advertising. And then I would have written the book very differently. I would have had pie charts and bar, bar graphs and, you know, headlines and sub headlines and nobody would have read it. It would have been the most boring thing. So I wrote it as a story and it's, but a real story. And the funny part is in this story, the result is known already. So I've written it like a thriller. It's very fast paced and it's, it literally wants you to know what's happening next. That was my aim when I started writing it. And um, I guess if someone goes to Amazon and reads the reviews of what people are saying, then they'll understand that everyone is reading it. It's not just students, anyone who likes a good story, anyone who's interested in the story of India. And today, you know, I think politics, they, they, they say there are two religions in India, which is cricket and Bollywood, but I say there's a third and it's politics. You know, politics is the new entertainment because what is not there in politics? There's antagonist, there's a protagonist, there's thrill, there's mystery, there's a result. There are rebuttals, there are salvos. I mean, what is not happening? And the consumer is the one who enjoys the most. And the consumer is the one who's gobbling it up. So, you know, this is what we are seeing all over. So that really would be my response. We'll dive into the book now. And um, I have read it and I would recommend everyone to read it. And I'll read it again when I'm back home. I normally read books on flights. Uh, but let me also now get into some of the content in the book. And uh, yeah. before I do that, I want to ask you two questions. One, you said right at the upfront, uh, a book has to be written. It is a combination of emotions, knowledge, writing, of yeah. course. So tell me in, in what way this book has been cathartic for you. Um, it's been cathartic because, you know, it, it helped me to channelize uh, my thoughts and my thinking and my observations and everything that I had seen so up close and personal from, you know, within the war room. Uh, so it was cathartic because it, it it's a process of creativity writing, you know, like I told you, I could have actually taken it the textbook way, but I wrote it like a thriller. 
it was so cathartic that you know when i was writing it i would say i need to go and see 99 south avenue that was the war room so I actually went to teen murti bhavan and i looked diagonally across and there was 99 south avenue so benign and so quiet but the walls and the rooms in the january to may of 2004 saw such action i went and saw the house in lodi road where we pitched for the first time so yeah, it was a whole process of going through it. And uh, um, so that, yeah, it was very cathartic. You're right. Okay. Now, political advertising, I was going to ask you two. So my second question is, uh, which of these chapters is your favorite chapter? Again, to ask an author, what is your favorite chapter out of a whole volume of the book is always, uh, you know, difficult for the author to answer, but sometimes authors do have their favorite chapters and they do share which one is their favorite chapter. So let me ask you, which is your favorite chapter in the book? So Anurag, you're asking a parent, like a parent to choose who's their favorite child. And it's very hard to give this answer, but, um, I, but I will answer you. And it is, you know, I think the part where we crack the strategy. So that comes, I think, chapter two, three, uh, for, you know, building up to the first round of pitch, everything, the day that we went there, how we waited in the cold, how we went into the room, how we were the only people who had carried a big screen, everyone else had only carried a laptop, they were underprepared, but I had got my team to go and check where the pitch will happen. The assumption was that it would be in 99 South Avenue, which was the war room, but no, they had planted it in Lodi Estate in some uh, MP's house. So we went and saw that room and it was full of paintings and sculpture and, you know, so I had to actually get a man to carry a screen and they were surprised. They said, what is all this you brought? And I said, no, we have, we have to present from a big screen and not from a laptop. So that's a very minor detail, but, um, uh, but I'm just saying, you know, all we got was a letter from them inviting us to a pitch within seven days no real proper formal brief. It was like, you study the market and tell us what you think is the opportunity or the problem and how we should take it ahead. And literally from there, because you know, when you start to think, this is not like a FMCG or a durable. It's like, you're talking to every Indian 18 plus. That's the biggest target audience in the world. At that time, it was 900 million people. So if you think you can go to 900 million people, you need an endless budget. So you have to, you know, target, you have to find out your right consumer. How did we crack the target, target consumer, the segmentation? How did we figure out what was the lacuna with what competition was doing? And then how we crafted the messages, created the campaign. So that part is really, you know, very exciting, I think, for a reader. Now, this is a book about 2004 elections. Right. Don't forget 2004. Yeah. We're talking about this book. You've written it 18 years of the elections. Yeah. Why are the secrets of 2004, or if I may use the word learnings, still relevant 18 years when the space has changed, uh, uh, so, so on and so forth? Um, you know, the question is how much has the space changed? The space has changed that there is a huge entrant, which is social media, which is being used a lot. And I'm going to amplify on this, but it is, you know, you are targeting consumers. You are targeting, you need to get to their heart. Today, you have an extra tool, which is social media, but you need to get to the voter. Now, the biggest challenge in any campaign, and it remains the same, whether it was 2004 or, or it is today, which is that you do all this work, all this work, all this work to make sure that on voting day, that person actually goes out to vote. Otherwise it's lost. It's not like consumer product where you have your 80, 20 rule where you know 20% of your heavy users give you 80% of your revenue. Here, every vote is equal, rich, poor, urban, rural, young, old. There's no difference between your vote and my vote. My vote is not giving you more money. Your vote is not giving more money than mine. So how do you nudge the person on the day of voting to go out to vote? So it's very different from normal brands. So that has not changed. 
that you need to find the right issues and you need to hit the heart and the mind so that on the right day there is action to actually leave your house and go and vote is something now you have to see in that in 2004 we saw 55% of india went to vote of which around 40 45% of urban india went and around 60 70% of rural india went vote they feel very empowered on that day so how are you choosing your consumer you choosing the one who's going to vote you choosing the one who likes to chit chat in drawing rooms and not go out i would look into all this data very clearly now social media yes we know that india is a very young country 50% 74% of india is below 34 years and our internet penetration is over a billion mobile mobile sorry not mobile uh, not internet mobile so there's a mobile in every hand and we know everyone's doing everything on the mobile they're doing their you know uh, for facebook they're doing their news they're doing everything on the mobile so it's a very e-commerce it's a very potent tool, tool today in somebody's hand and the best part is there's a lot of data as they say data is the new oil are you drilling that data properly if you drill that data properly politics is not about you know the urban consumer i'm going to the metro consumer i'll find my consumer base it's going down to that last booth that last mohalla that last man in the village or woman so how are you going to target today because of the mobile you have a two way communication i communicate they can respond i look at the data i know exactly what they're seeing what content they're looking at what they share where they click and i can target messages directly to people so this is a huge new thing that's come in having said this you know there are still a lot of people in rural india for example internet connectivity is 30% how many women are actually so into using their mobile phone so to say that i'll just give up on mass media and just go to totally mobile would also be dangerous so what is the balance you're playing in media terms it's a very complicated canvas political advertising marketing is a very political uh, you know it's it's very exciting if you can get your teeth into it properly but you can make a lot of mistakes okay now so essentially you're saying that the challenge remains the same and when i was uh, reading the book one more variable nota there was no nota in 2004 you know it was a binary choice you know so sort of yes or no for a party yeah. now it uh, it can be a nota so that's a new addition now let me also ask you uh, while we're talking about the book let me ask you you spent so many years in the business of advertising marketing media mm, you were the president for north for leo burnett uh, how do you think has our profession changed how do you think the agency business now that you're a little outside yeah. you think about it you see it from the outside you teach you reflect upon it how do you think the business has changed and what do you think the ad agencies need to do to be able to realign themselves uh with the transformation possibilities that exist you know um yes you're right there has been a lot of change and it's uh, i also talked to a lot of my friends today who are ceos in different agencies so the business has become very hard uh, what they tell me is that the revenues are way for thin margins are very very thin attracting good talent is hard in our time you know uh, for example lentas was a day one company where i spent 18 years day one company uh, on campus at jamna lal bajaj where i did my mba and uh, ad agencies used to get people from the iim stop business schools now i think you know even level 3 level 4 i don't know how many business school you know kids are going because so many more opportunities have opened up like the tech industry and telecom and you know so much so many more attractive things and if the salaries are not keeping pace you know if your starting salary is 2 or 3 lakhs uh, per annum lower than your batchmates then as much as you would want to go into it you know you um, uh, it's a hard choice to make uh, having and talent therefore is um, i don't know the best of talent is coming into the industry but i must say that the industry is still uh, you know giving out so much of good creative work still you know such amazing campaigns like 
uh, the, the recent ones for Dove or Tanishq or Cadbury or, you know, so many more. So uh, it's fabulous. In our, the difference is that in our time when I started at Linta's, you know, we would take one option to the client at the most two if the client was very big. And we would say that we are Linta's, we are suggesting this and this runs. And oh my God, till the time I left, every client for every single job wanted a hundred iterations. If there was a pitch called in the Delhi market, even for a one crore client, you would have 10 agencies, uh, you know, uh, landing up for the pitch. So it's got very competitive. That's what I'd say. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll come back to the book again. Let me bring in my uh, senior editorial colleague and our senior editor, Mr. Ruhel Lamin into the conversations to ask you specific questions about the chapters in the book and about the book. Uh, so let me bring in Mr. Ruhel Amin uh, for the next set of questions. Mr. Amin, Ms. Jashvi Sundar and you, all yours. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thanks. Uh, we've been talking about, uh, you know, I, yeah, uh, talking about uh, the book earlier as well. So I, I want to first touch upon the creativity aspect of this, you know, I mean, uh, in political campaigns, uh, we've seen uh, the colors, even the fonts, and they have been of a certain type, if you look at it, for example. Yeah. Uh, give me a sense of when you see uh, from 2004 to 2022 uh, now, um, how has it evolved in terms of uh, the kind of, you know, style, the neatness, you know, the hygiene factors, the creativity at all? Well, how do you see that changed? Um, firstly, the creativity factor. Let me just talk for a minute about 2004. You know, uh, we were pitted against India Shining, which was going on full page ads and long 60 second commercials, mostly in English. And our entire strategy was to take it regional and rural. And therefore it was a lot of language advertising um, you know, in various languages across the country. Um, honestly speaking, from then to now, I haven't seen any huge change, if you ask me. I don't think there's been any huge change and I don't think there's anything that's been very standout or, you know, brilliant. Uh, this is my personal view. So you are saying, are you saying this, Ms. Sundar? that political advertising, uh, in spite of becoming a mainstream project product uh, or mainstream phenomena, hasn't evolved in the years? Is that it what you are saying? If it evolved. has evolved, in what, in what way has it evolved? Let me ask. Have, it has evolved strategically, definitely. Uh, you know, strategies of how to reach the consumer, how to have technology, how to uh, do your messaging. Uh, but I wish the creative would be a little more uh, focused and really, you know, better. That I can only use that word. I don't want to beat around the bush. And you know, the ir irreverence, sometimes the irreverence in advertising gets attention, gets the message to uh, be driven home. I don't see these days, either I see very offensive campaigns or I see very docile campaigns. I don't see irreverent campaigns uh, which stay in the limits of, uh, you know, decent advertising, but are irreverent, you know, they're, they're I think civil. I mean, like, you know, like in the cola wars, for example, when Coke and Pepsi or Thumbs Up and Pepsi have it out, that is irreverence or, or BMW and Mercedes, you know, the, or Apple and Samsung. Those are irreverent, they're hitting out each other, but they are not uh, offensive to the core. And uh, I think a lot of, because today you can't trace back, especially in the mobile and internet arena, there's so much of fake news, there's so much of hatred, there's so much of stuff and who is saying what, uh, they are trying to bring in a code of conduct, but I don't know, you can get away with a lot of things. Hmm. You know, again, uh, Rohel will uh, come in, but just yeah. before Rohel comes in, I want to ask you a personal question. You raise a successful family. Uh, you now teach at business school. You've been a senior executive, an outshot executive. You have a social circle. Uh, you've written a book. Is there a bucket list that Jayashree Sundar has? Or <laughs> what is left to be done? You've written a book on cooking with uh, 
your husband the books. there's one earlier one also which was yes. my mom's and then this and then yeah so everybody is asking me what's your next book going to be on and i said i'm going to do something lighter not such hard work <laughs> you know but i don't know i don't know what the next thing is going to be but it's been very exciting to uh, you know uh, find this path of an author you know at this stage of my life so you can never say never and i hope if there are young people listening you know you can always keep drilling deep into yourself and find out new things to do okay royal back to you perfect um uh, miss sundar tell me uh, you know a lot of people have got into professionally into uh, political campaigning and making careers out of it uh, uh, when you talk about successful campaigns uh, what are the factors in your view that would define a successful political campaign um definitely getting the consumer piece right you know who are you targeting and what are you going to say to them very simply put if that goes wrong so assume that we've got that right i think one of the most potent tools in political advertising compared to any other is the slogan if you get a good slogan then that gets currency with people and people start talking about it like india shining was a good slogan for urban india a lot of urban india people were very taken up by it till till hours was created and it came and became a part of common lingo aam aadmi ko kya mila aam aadmi ko kya mila it would just come and like for example barack obama's yes we can or even trumps i mean his supporters this is not my personal whatever ideology but make america great again that you know in political advertising you have to hit the nationalistic the pride factor for a country the hope there are those things that you have to press the buttons on you know so it's it's a little broad based compared to your own soap or cola or footwear or your tv that you're selling right 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 a quick question uh, what have you not written in the book which you wanted to write about there are some secrets which are with me <laughs> you know small things little pranks that used to get played okay i'll tell you all one absolutely i have i've always said that there was no mistake in 5 months and i think some 3000 pieces of original work and what not but on the last day in the last ad there was a mistake they don't know till today but i'm saying it a small mistake but i think that euphoria of winning and everything so it was uh kept uh, we just shut up about it but yeah the book has a lot about the decoy acts and about you know we had built a secret room in the office and there was an armed guard there and we had mobile telephones which used to get tapped and then we used to have to change our phone numbers we used to shred paper every night take it in a sack and go and throw it somewhere far away so if you read the book there's a lot of it the excitement it's you don't do this for any other like time you know yeah like making of a thriller it is making of a thriller okay miss sundar i want to, i want to ask you this question i am a big believer in the craft of advertising of communication of creating the right connect the right messaging but how much role can advertising play in today's world in 2022 when the world is polarized when there is social media when there is uh, certain parts of the media which are pliable uh, aren't we giving too much credit to political advertising to be able to impact an election well i would never say that it's too much credit but it's also wrong to say that it's the only thing because it can never be the only thing in a marketing mix you always have uh, you have the client first and how much energy they had how many rallies they went to how much of today it's like how many technology seminar how many webinars whatever you know how how are they reaching people so um it is it's all that it's it's the strategy that comes from there it's the rank and file of the party it's the guy right down to the last booth and what he's doing and how he's galvanizing the people there but what advertising can do is to find you the right consumer to target and to give you a damn potent slogan which becomes a part of common lingo which fires up the imagination of people and uh, which which talks to your heart you know which 
which emotionally binds you and that's the day you go out then and take the action so it can help but it can never be the only thing right my my final question is about you know uh, a lot of campaigns have taken place after 2004 uh, from uh, of different political parties across india any campaign that has really caught your attention and why um well i would yeah let's talk about a few um i if you don't mind i'll talk about a couple internationally one that really i think fired up and you we saw the result was obama's yes we can because it it was so simple just three words but it fired up a whole lot of people who were feeling oppressed or who wanted a change who wanted you know just he just egged everyone and said that just don't worry you're having a bad day you can get over it you know and together we will take this country again it's not that i'm a trump supporter or anything but his taking of ronald reagan's line let's make america great again to make america great again actually is a very competitive line when you say make america great again you're trying to say that america's bad but i will come and make it great again so as a slogan and uh, he lost but you know he had about 72 million votes or whatever it is so there there were his people were happy with it um coming closer home to india in the last uh, few years there have been some there have been some in pockets here and there um prime minister modi's campaign acche din acche din is a good signal uh, so, slogan and a good campaign plank you know and he got the result i mean people like that uh, that uh, thought so uh, you know i'm not talking only for the congress i'm just talking for someone who's observing things it so yeah. happened that i worked on a congress campaign because i was professionally you know hmm. tasked with that job but yeah his, his his was a it was a good slogan so of Let course you have, you. To, you have to be careful with slogans because you say something and anybody any party you can make promises but then if you don't stand up to it then the consumer comes to bite you with your slogan you know so it's it you have to take the whole uh, thing into the you know in it's part Absolutely. of the whole game yeah let me ask you throughout your life you work with corporate clients yeah you know uh, corporates business houses brands how is it working with a political party with a with working with clients uh what are the differences and what are the similarities they are different anurag because unlike most clients who have an agency on a continuous basis what i find with political parties is come a general election or come an assembly election they ask for agencies to come and pitch and then i don't think they keep that agency on board till you know like a regular client and then come the next general election they get another agency so it is it's a task you are there for 5 6 months or you know whatever it is one year eight months then you're out so so it's that secondly they are not regular users of advertising agency so like an mnc vice president brand manager of a regular client they know exactly the process here it was but i must say they learned very fast for example the meeting i went when we went to discuss the financials how it would happen i knew that these people had done their homework and they had probably talked to a lot of people figured out how things work so they were very quick in picking up things and i think we worked with some fantastic people on their side so yeah that's the difference you know so also when you get your translations i'll tell you some, something small if you're getting your bengali translation checked you know you're sitting in delhi it usually goes to the uh, calcutta office of the client and somebody there in the regional office will say okay this fine change this one word that word here guess who was checking the bengali translation it was mr pranab mukherjee gurmukhi translation uh, you know dr mms so it was Ahmed Patel was looking at the Gujarati translation. So our young executives were running to all these people's houses late in the night. So it is a different ball game. It is a different ball game. Okay. My last question before I get Royal to ask the last question. When you look in retrospect, what could you have done better to be able to get even a better result? Though it was a, as you said, it was a win. It was a surprise win for a lot of people. 
Yes, and sir. what do you think yes, the, the incumbent party at that time, BJP was the incumbent party, could have done to be able to do a better campaign? I think as far as our campaign went, um, you know, we said, let's do an honest campaign, real campaign. So it ran mostly in black and white. And as the promise stage came that if we, if you bring us back to power, we will do this. That was the little pieces in color. If we, if we could do it again, I would say if there was a little more budget, we would have put some more ads into urban India, but taking the strategy regional and language was actually the big, big blue ocean strategy that worked for us. As far as BJP is concerned, I think they peaked too early. They started uh, India Shining in October and the elections actually started in April. So I think they peaked too early or, yeah, yeah I have a feeling. Right. Uh, Ruel, your last question yeah. before we call it a... Uh, so, you know, uh, it, this is certain kind of mainstreaming of uh, political advertising now, you know, it's like you see it as finesse and, you know, it has become a professional thing much more than what it used to be. And a lot of young uh, professionals are looking at this as a serious career. Yeah. Being a veteran in this field, uh, what is your advice to them? How can they excel at what they're doing? You know, this is an area of detail. Okay, so if you are the type I, I teach and I know the attention span of young people. I don't want to deride them. They're extremely smart. The reason why I teach is I want to be in the world of young people. Their energy is amazing, but they have so many distractions and they are constantly uh, skimming from here to there. If you want to get into this arena, you've got to roll up your sleeves and you've got to drill deep and you have to stay very focused. And you have to get into the nitty gritty of India. So an Andhra Pradesh is very different from a Gujarat, is very different from a Tamil Nadu. So you, if you want to look into this, you really have to get deep into the issues of every state. Where are their farmer suicides? Where is migration an issue? Where is education an issue? Where are women's issues an issue? Where is literacy an issue? And what are the messages you're going to give right down to that last uh, mm -hmm. thing right from the capital of that state. So it's hard work. It's drilling deep, but it's also very exciting. So if, if this is what you, you like, then uh, it's a great place to be, I think. Absolutely. Thank you so much. There's Adarsh P, there's Ayushi Mathur, there's Deepak Abhi, there's Jayati Mukherjee, Mega Abhi, Meeta Banerjee, Neeta Raheja, Nikhil Talwar, Sundar, Vidur Beri. Any of you would like to ask a question? If not, I will ask my last question. If you want to ask a question, please type it in the chat box uh, uh, and let me know if you want to ask a question. Otherwise, let me ask Ms. Sundar uh, the last question. Ms. Sundar, uh, a lot has been said about the fact that our society has become very, very polarized. The world has become very polarized. You talked to 70 plus million voters that voted for Trump. The fact is, it shows the polarization even in the US, right? Yeah. It is, you can see it daily on social media. You can show, see it in news channels. Um, what do you as a commentator, if I mean, you're an author, you're a teacher, you've been a professional, you've been a CEO, but as a commentator, what do you think communication can do and especially, is there space for political advertising that in some way binds rather than divides? Because more and more communication today is to divide. If I may, you know, I'm generalizing a bit, but I'm not off the mark on that. What do you think can be the role that communication and advertising plays to be able to bring people together, to kind of do away with these fissures, at least bridge them a bit, even if not do away with you know, the very nature of political advertising is that it it is, there are two or three or four parties. Now we're seeing in the regional election, some of the states have four parties, for example, UP or uh, Uttarakhand, you know, they are, so it, each one is fighting to give their message out. But I think to answer your question, the one that fires up the imagination of people uh, to be proud of their state or, the, or their country, 
uh, will be the one that will be less, uh, you know, divisive and creating fissures and bringing that nationalistic, wonderful feeling in people that, you know, everyone wants peace and to live happily. So um, I think the people who fan a national sentiment in the advertising will be the ones who will, who will be able to do what you're saying. Get Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope the trend reverses. I hope uh, there are positive lessons from your book that people take away and strategies that take away. Uh, this is Jashri Sundar and she's been talking to us about her book, uh, Don't Forget 2004, which is about ele winning election strategies, uh, political campaigns, so advertising secrets of a surprise victory. So thank you so much, Jashri Sundar, for talking to us. I'm sure uh, you would have inspired people to write a book to be able to put their thoughts together and bring it together for people to be able to learn, to contextualize, and to be able to then implement them. So wish you luck in your endeavors. Look forward to your book. And my suggestion, you and Sundar should host a lunch or a dinner with your dishes and happy to we join. Will. <laughs> we will. Thank we you will. so much. has to cook for everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Batra. It's, it's really an honor for me to be here and really enjoyed this chat with you. And thank, thank you, you so much, Ruhel, also for all your support and all the nice questions today. Thank you so much to the whole Business World Exchange for Media Impact platform. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening. We recommend this book to all of you and look forward to reading its review in the next issue of Impact. Thank you so much. Cheers. Bye.